Um, today's webinar, and, and also welcome everybody for attending today. The webinar today, Burner Retrofitting What, Why, and How, has really been designed to give the owner or the specifier of a, of a possible retrofit burner application a, a clearer understanding of, of what considerations should go into a proper selection or really if it should be seriously considered at all. Now, as we all know and, and we've all experienced at one time or another, once the decision has been made to pursue a purchase, it's the informed buyer as much uh, it, that we've found is much more apt to get the best value for the dollar invested uh, as they know what's important and what one needs to consider in order to arrive at the best and most economical decision for them. And that's not just for now, but for the future as well. So, you know, with that in mind, what we will be referring to today will encompass uh, steam and hot water commercial and industrial boilers, and they'll be spanning a range from 250,000 to 92 million BTUs per hour. And now that equates, if you do the math, to approximately 8 to 2,200 boiler horsepower. And uh, as such, we'll be including uh, fire tube boilers, commercial water tubes, industrial water tubes, the cast iron boilers, fox, uh, the firebox boilers, because they all fall into this, uh, this size range. Now, the industries that will uh, be impacted uh, are really all over the map. Uh, and I've included a few of the major ones on the screen to include, as you can see, manufacturing, apartments, offices, and warehouses. But, you know, the, the list also includes hospitals, nursing homes, schools, government institutions. Again, just a plethora of applications. And so to begin to narrow the focus even further, uh, I thought it would be good to start with the, what are the major drivers out there which would cause one to consider a possible burner retrofit, knowing you know, full well that, that borders which have been well maintained will last a real long time. In, as a matter of fact, 30 or 40 years and beyond is not at all uncommon. And then when we're looking for the Achilles heel of these border packages, it's normally the burner which needs major upgrading or replacement during this period. And so as you can see, the factors that drive this are number one, reliability. Of course, that's reducing the amount of downtime along with process improvement in these process applications, product improvement. And then of course, the economics. And we're trying to save on our fuel bills. We're also looking at process losses and then the maintenance costs that go along with uh, maintaining this boiler burner package. Then, of course, we've got the environmental impact, which affects the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and the carbon footprint that we leave behind. And all of which, these, as far as these environmental factors, can be controlled and, of course, mandated by local, state, and federal authorities. Now, let's start then with the reliability driver. What are the reasons we most often find which impact reliability and, and may call for a burner replacement? Well, you know, the first thing is the burner is just plain worn out. And usually this is after about 15 years we've been finding. Of course, these burners have a very low combustion efficiency. They have frequent pilot and main flame outages and will require a major overhaul of the linkages, the air housing, maybe the firing head, uh, just to keep it running regardless of the innate low efficiency. The, the next major reason which impacts reliability is, is the inability to secure the proper parts and service when needed. And of course, this is often due to the fact that the burner has reached its obsolescence and or the, the manufacturer or his representative is no longer in the area or has gone out of business. And then there's the, the possibility the burner is, is only capable of burning one fuel. And having the ability to burn a more readily available fuel or, or one to serve as a standby is just what is needed to assure reliability and assured uptime, especially when the load is critical for a heating or a process application. Um. We've also encountered many times when the burner is just undersized for the load. That means the burner boiler package is undersized for the load because the, uh, the production capacity has grown and the boiler is no longer able to keep up causing process variations and slowdowns. Now, in these cases, the boiler is in excellent shape 
And the only question is if the manufacturer approves additional input without it adversely affecting the boiler itself because of overfiring. And I'll get into this a little bit later uh, more deeply. And while I'm, I'm talking about improving reliability, and, and though this is not directly related to the burner per se, when an upgrade or replacement of the burner is being considered, it's really an excellent time to take a hard look at the burner management system, or what is also referred to as the programmer. Now, this is the control which takes the burner through its proper and safe sequence and then shuts it down if certain safety switches are not closed before, during, uh, before and during light off, the main flame and also its overall operation. Now, if the customer has an old, outdated device, the new microprocessor-based controls from Honeywell or FireEye, they not only offer the safeties and sequence control, but fairly extensive operating information and diagnostics, which significantly reduce troubleshooting time thereby improving reliability as a, as a result. And speaking of advanced diagnostics, the PLC-based control platforms today not only incorporate the burner management system, the programmer, but also can include interconnection with a plethora of controls including variable speed drive, oxygen trim, draft control, combustion control, lead lag, and so on. Now, this is in addition to touchscreen graphics for easy view and access to system dynamics, data gathering and possibly trending, and easy inputting of operational changes including the pressure or temperature changes. And while I'm talking about more advanced controls, I would really be remiss if I didn't at least mention the new improved microprocessor-based operating and modulating controls out there today, which assist reliability as it relates to more precise control of the pressure or temperature. It really narrows the dead band, allowing the process variable to be, uh, variable to be more tightly held. This, of course, improves production time and, of course, quality. So again, this is not a must with a burner retrofit, but when you're considering it, it's also a good time to consider some of the associated controls which will positively contribute to the overall final result. The next major driver for burner retrofit, of course, as I mentioned, is economics, probably the most important of all. And as you can see from the chart on the screen, the cost of operation is significantly impacted by the cost of fuel, and to a lesser extent, but still significant, by repairs, supplies, and services in and out. Now, a new, properly selected and applied burner can have a significant impact on these costs. For instance, and as I alluded to earlier with regard to reliability, let's say that we have the existing burner, which is in fairly good shape, but it is strictly designed to burn only natural gas. Now, contacting the local utility, we find the price per decatherm can be greatly reduced if we have a standby fuel which can be switched to during peak demand. So, having a combination oil-gas burner would accommodate this possibility, and the existing burner may be retrofitable for this situation. It's certainly worth checking out. Or, in the case of the burner boiler package where it's oversized due to a cutback in load. This causes the burner to cycle inordinately, and when it does, the cycle costs due to pre and post purge losses can easily equal 15%. And, and you know, when you have a fuel bill that's averaging $725,000 per year for, let's say, a 400 horsepower boiler operating about 4,300 or uh, 4,400 hours per year, you know, that's no chump change. It's over $100,000 a year. And, and then we have the case where the burner is not in good shape, as alluded to earlier, under reliability reasons. Now, in this situation, we have a very poor combustion resulting in high excess air and possibly very high CO. This also leads to very low combustion efficiency, and as such, the burner is probably not worth investing additional dollars in. Remember, when we're talking about high excess air, this is nothing more than blowing 
dollars through the stack. Now, as you can see on the slide, for every 2% increase in excess air, we lose 1% in overall efficiency. Now, in this case, we've gone from 3% O2, which would be the same as 15% excess air, to 7%. And this then gives us a loss of 2% overall. And believe me, believe me, this is not at all uncommon. Now, in this slide, you see where many of the burners operate today because the burner-boiler combination were not properly sized to the load at the outset, or the fuel-air ratio is not adequately controlled at the lower firing rates due to wear in many cases, but also because of poor damper blade design. Notice how the excess air climbs once dropping to the 50% firing rate. Substantial dollars are wasted here. And in most cases, people are just totally unaware. The other thing we have to be aware of when evaluating an existing burner for economic reasons is its turndown capability. The ability of the burner to track the load between low and high fire without cycling off. Now, as mentioned, this saves the pre- and post-purge losses and puts dollars back in the user's pocket. Many burners out there today, they're limited to four to one turn down or less, which exacerbates the problem. Having a burner capable of higher turn down, let's say 10 to one, would help the situation immeasurably. And then there is the type of combustion control employed for metering the fuel and air mix. Now, many of them are what we refer to as single point positioning systems with a single damper motor or modulating motor driving a single jack shaft connected to the respective linkages and cams as shown in the drawing on the screen in the, on the left. These can include provisions for a single fuel only or they may be equipped with a dual position modulating motor and linkage and cam arrangements to accommodate dual fuels. In either case, these systems, though widely utilized and proven effective, are not the best for the long-term use as the linkages have a tendency to wear, they have a tendency to slip and deflect, and this causes a lack of proper control and proper metering of the fuel and air as the running time advances. This can result in too rich or too lean combustion, meaning that we've not only created a loss of efficiency, but what could be a very dangerous situation as well. The answer to this problem is applying a parallel positioning combustion control system in replacing the linkages with this parallel positioning system. Now in this case, we have independent motorized actuators which are driving the fuel and air as dictated by a central controller getting its information from the boiler's modulating control. Now, this not only means more accurate uh, control overall, but repeatable control throughout the entire turndown range. Now, as a matter of fact, when these combustion control systems are applied to an existing burner or are part of a new burner retrofit, one can expect a minimum of two to 5% savings in fuel just because of this change out of, of the burner and replacing those linkages. And when considering the, the burner retrofit again, uh, we cannot forget other options which will improve the economic picture once we've, that once we've made the, the choice to upgrade. For instance, the, the stack damper uh, can be applied to the existing stack and be tied into the central control system. Now, this device is used to suppress excessive, excessive draft which throws off combustion, and then it closes when the burner is off, saving needless energy dollars due to ambient air being pulled through the border, cooling it, and then robbing valuable BTUs, which are then exhausted to the atmosphere. You know, it's, it's a relatively cheap retrofit, which can easily pay for itself in a year or less. The, the next option one should not forget is the oxygen trim system which adjusts the fuel and air ratio based on changing atmospheric conditions such as ambient air temperature, barometric pressure, and relative humidity. Now, this is, this, this is a must consideration 
if you have a boiler installed outside or in a room with varying conditions. Because again, these conditions, especially ambient air temperature, can dramatically affect the burner's performance as it relates to rich combustion, which would cause sooting, and of course generate CO, or lean combustion resulting in too much excess air. And then there's the costs associated with electrical energy consumption. Now, in this case, I'm primarily referring to the electrical energy consumed by the fan motor on the burner, which is supplying combustion air. Now, in larger boilers, this motor can be of significant size. I mean, I'm talking a range of 25 to 100 horsepower or more. And drawing considerable amperage or electrical current. However, if the speed can be modulated based on the load requirement, significant energy can be saved. And I'm talking about as much as 40 percent. Uh, For instance, the horsepower in electrical motor varies by the cube factor related to its speed. Now, when you have a system where the air damper is wide open, the speed of the motor is 100 percent, the flow is 100 percent, and the horsepower required is 100 percent. Now, as soon as you start to close the damper, the motor will still be 100 percent. The flow is, let's say, 70 percent, and the horsepower required at this flow is approximately 90 percent. Now, if the flow goes to 50%, the motor is still at 100, and the horsepower required is about 60%. Now, if you install a VFD or a variable frequency drive in this application and remove the damper, and the flow required is 70%, the motor speed will be 70%, and the horsepower required will be 34%. If the flow required is 50%, the motor will be at 50% speed, and the horsepower required is only 12.5%. So, as you can see, there is less horsepower required with the variable frequency drive installed, 34% versus 90%, 12.5% versus 60%. These horsepower differences translate directly into energy savings. And if you consider the increasing cost of electrical power, and that most systems operate between 50 and 80%, the payback time for installing a VFD can be realized very quickly. The last driver we will be addressing today is environmental. And of course, this has to do primarily with minimizing noxious effluents from emitting from the stack as a result of the fuel we are burning and of course the combustion process. The main one is limiting nitrogen oxides of NO and NO2, which are precursors of low level ozone or smog. And what we have found as an industry to accomplish this most effectively and economically is through the use of low NOx burners and flue gas recirculation. Low NOx burners are specially designed and engineered to better control the combustion process by limiting the temperature, which is the main reason for NOx propagation, but doing this without quenching the flame, not easy but it, it's, it's, we've mastered that. And this is done through proper staging and shaping of the combustion air. And then introducing the fuel into the proper streams of air, as you can see here, to not only achieve excellent mixing of fuel and air, but also control the temperature so as not to develop large amounts of thermal NOx while the hot gases pass or progress through the boiler itself. Now, some of these burners can achieve as low as 30 parts per million NOx without any other supplementary equipment being added, such as flue gas recirculation, selective catalytic reduction, or non-selective catalytic reduction. And speaking of flue gas recirculation, this is what we, again as an industry, have found to be the most effective and economical way of achieving low NOx as long as the burner has been so designed to achieve excellent combustion and has been adapted to accommodate the introduction of a certain percentage of flue gas, which is then mixed with ambient combustion air coming from the room. And here's how it works. You see the combustion air coming in at the top left of the picture and mixing with a percentage of flue gas coming from the fourth pass in this fire tube boiler before the balance of this flue gas exits to the stack. 
Now, this flue gas passes through a small damper, as you can see, which allows just enough to properly mix with the ambient room air, feeding the flame as it lowers its temperature without quenching it. The amount of flue gas recirculation will depend upon the amount of NOx reduction required, which in some cases is as low as five parts per million or less. Now bear in mind that an uncontrolled natural gas flame will produce up to as much as 120 parts per million. So that basically wraps up the what and why part of our discussion today. So let's turn our attention now to burner selection and, adap and uh, the adaptation. In other words, now that we know what's driving demand, the reliability, economics, and the environment that's driving the demand, and we also have talked about the why considerations associated with these categories, let's use this information now that we've talked about to properly select a burner for just about any application. We'll, we'll start by looking at this list of burner retrofit considerations. And one has to, 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 you have to have these in mind to properly investigate the options out there in selecting the right burner for a particular application. Now, you see it's divided into sections, including application information, performance requirements, and then the installation considerations. We'll start at the top with application information, border make and model, and furnace, but starting with border make and model. This is a very important step, as the proper application of the burner to the boiler is crucial for achieving optimum efficiency and longevity of the border burner asset, especially if the burner is undersized for the existing border because of load increases. The manufacturer, and I have to highlight this, the manufacturer needs to be contacted to make sure there is sufficient radiant and convective, uh, convective surface in the border to absorb the additional BTUs, which would be coming from this new upsize burner without compromising proper heat transfer and the vessel itself. And then there's the possibility of load reduction, wherein the burner needs to be downsized. Now in this case, we need to assure ourselves the circulation in the boiler is not compromised and that we will not have the additional problem of flue gas condensing in the boiler or in its stack. Again, we've got to contact the manufacturer to find out what this reduction in input would do to that boiler. And because, of course, and if we're talking about the boiler condensing or the, the flue gas condensing, this is corrosive stuff and will soon manifest itself uh, in metal corrosion of those surfaces coming in contact with it. Furnace pressure is the next major consideration as exceeding this limitation either on the positive or on the negative side will impact combustion and rob the border of its optimum efficiency. For instance, and as you can see, Many furnaces in these applications run well with a furnace pressure of, let's say, four inches of, of water column. Again, the manufacturer needs to confirm this. But in a, a positive deviation, in other words, going up by as little as one half inch over this tolerance, will cause the burner to be derated by anywhere from three to five percent. Now, the other thing you need to be aware of with regard to furnace pressure is if there are any other devices which may have been added, such as a stack economizer or a fixed damper, which might impose additional back pressure, causing the overall pressure in the furnace to rise and reduce output accordingly, while also causing combustion problems. The furnace dimensions are also important from a combustion perspective, as its configuration and volume allow for the time for the flame to completely combust without impinging on the furnace walls. Remember, combustion requires time, temperature, and turbulence. The burner will supply the heat and the turbulence, but what provides the time? It's the furnace, and that's why it's so important that we understand what we're firing into to give us the proper time to properly combust without impinging on the furnace walls, which could be very, very problem, especially with a water tube boiler. 
Now, the next important area to be aware of are the operating pressure or temperature in the case of a hot water boiler. Now, this is important as it is the basis for reading stack temperatures, and those temperatures will vary based on the operating pressure or temperature being maintained in the vessel. We also must be aware of the input required to the burner in order to achieve the necessary horsepower. In other words, if we need 1 million BTUs for our process or heating space, we need to divide this figure by the expected efficiency of the boiler burner package to determine the proper input to the burner. For instance, let's say we have an operating efficiency of 80%. We would divide 1 million BTUs by 0 0.80. That would give us 1,250,000 BTUs required input, or said in another way, we need a burner size for 1,250,000 BTU capacity to achieve 1 million BTUs output. Next, let's look at something that often doesn't get the attention it deserves, footprint and available versus required clearances. As you can easily see on the slide, we have highlighted the critical areas one needs to consider. And as you can also see, some burner manufacturers have some flexibility when trying to apply a retrofit burner in some challenging spots. For instance, the manufacturer may be able to invert the burner 180 degrees if the center line clearance from the furnace to the floor is limited. The burner's blast tube might also be extended to clear the smoke box if necessary. And the burner's control panel might also be relocated if that would be more convenient. Remember, too, the importance of burner support, especially with those burners with an extended blast tube. You know, you have a built-in cantilever effect in these cases, which will cause stress on the blast tube and consequential cracking due to normal combustion vibration, uh, if, of course, if it isn't properly supported. And then we have fuel and power supply, elevation, and codes and standards. Now, as far as fuel is concerned, the burner retrofit is a good time to make the decision on the type of fuel that you want to burn, one which is readily available and economical and forgiving from an emissions perspective as may be mandated by federal, state, or local regulations for a specific region or locale. Now, normally, natural gas is the fuel of choice, but considering a standby fuel such as number two oil or propane might make good codes or standards which might impact the installation as well as the operating parameters. I also mentioned altitude or elevation. Again, something which needs to be considered when the existing burner is changed out. With most burners out there today, uh, one can expect full input with the standard equipment until you go to, let's say, a thousand feet some cases it might be 2,000 feet, but most commonly we see 1,000. About, above this point, the combustion air will change. And as a result, in other words, the density, as a result, the diameter of the blower motor wheel, which might also impact the blower motor size because it is enlarged or greater diameter. And this, of course, as I mentioned, is because of the density changes in the air and the elevation may also impact the burner components, such as orifice diameters and so on. So altitude is a very important consideration that the informed buyer or specifier needs to be cognizant of. Now let's move to the performance considerations that we need to be aware of with a burner retrofit. They include, as you can see, the burner characteristics, combustion control system, the burner management system or programmer, atomization choice, and turndown along with emissions and excess air, which I'll cover in a minute. As far as the burner characteristics are concerned, what's important is the quality of manufacture and if the burner can accommodate the features you desire for the application. 
For instance, in a single point positioning combustion control system using linkages, are the linkages held together with, with pins, with C-clamps or cotter pins? Or is it a more robust system using ball joints, nuts, and bolts? You know, it might seem like a minor issue, but if the burner modulates a lot and it has a single point positioning system, believe me, it's no minor issue. Now, other considerations are the materials used, including the gauge of the metal and the trim employed, such as pressure and temperature switches, gauges, and valves. Are they all robust and of high quality? What about the ease of switching fuels and the ability to burn a non-standard fuel should the occasion arise in the future? And, and then what about the ease of service? And can we even get it? Can we get parts and service in our area? And then there is the combustion control system that I, I want to use. Do I want the standard single point positioning system with an upgraded dual fuel modulating motor or am I willing to spend additional dollars for an upgraded and more efficient parallel positioning system? And what about the burner management system or the programmer? There are a number of choices out there including microprocessor based systems with excellent alpha callouts for not only providing sequence status but also troubleshooting information to expedite troubleshooting and reduce the downtime. Or it may be the time to totally upgrade to a PLC-based platform, which not only includes the, the advanced burner management system, but also allows one to tie in other related systems into a common base with excellent graphics and touch screen interfacing. Then, if I'm going to be burning oil, let's say number two as my standby, what type of atomizing do I want? The choices include mechanical or pressure atomizing or air atomizing. Now, the mechanical is the least expensive and certainly the best choice if the burner is, if the fuel is burned infrequently. That would be the standby fuel. If, on the other hand, number two oil is the primary fuel or will be used frequently as standby, then the air atomizing burner is the better choice as you will get better overall burn because of the excellent intermingling of fuel and air prior to spontaneous ignition. And then what about turndown? Extremely important for the reasons previously discussed regarding the minimizing of cycling, which is a huge energy waster. So if you, if you have a load which is steady, requiring little modulation, minimal turndown is absolutely fine. On the other hand, if the load varies, high turndown will not only positively impact the wallet, it will also assist in tracking and maintaining the load as well. And in some cases, this is really more important than saving money, just tracking that load. The next thing we need to keep in mind is emissions. Are you in an area where NOx is limited? Or maybe the company has a culture, including a deep respect for the environment, and wants to do all it can to further clean the air and other natural resources which are finite and are perishable. Whatever the motivation, a retrofit burner system may be just the answer for the reasons previously discussed, which oftentimes means the use of a low-nox burner and or flue gas recirculation. One thing I did want to mention here, though, is that with low NOx requirements, the turndown on the burner may be limited to maintain low CO levels at low fire. So make sure you check with the manufacturer or the authorized representative to see what this reduction in turndown may be. Extremely important. Now, excess air is the last consideration under the performance area. And it begins with the proper air handling system used to deliver the combustion air to the burner itself. Now here you see four different damper arrangements, including the blade, the rotary integral, the rotary gun, and the multi-vane. Now of these, the rotary damper, at least we have found in all of our experience, to be the most accurate in delivering just the right amount of air in as close to a linear fashion as possible throughout the turndown range, especially once the burner passes the 25% firing rate 
and then increases its input. And here you see a typical curve for a rotary type damper, whether it be part of an integral or a gun type burner. Note the excursion of air at the 25% and below point. Now, this is because we have a constant speed fan which is delivering air at a fairly high pressure, causing leakage around the damper as the, as the, uh, at the very low rate. Now, this tells me two things. Number one, if the burner resides in this low fire position for much of its operating time, the boiler will be very inefficient because of the high excess air. Now, this is because the boiler burner package is too large for the average load. You need reduced capacity so the package can operate at or near its peak efficiency, which may be anywhere between 70 and 100%, and this will vary, vary by manufacturer. Remember, too, what I said about derating and making sure the manufacturer concurs. The next thing we need to consider here is if the border spends a lot of time at low fire and it cannot be derated, it's to consider adding a variable speed drive to the fan motor to reduce the mass flow and the pressure, thereby reducing the excess air at the 25% firing rate and below. This will save energy, not only on fuel, but electrical as well. The last thing we want to talk about today is the installation consideration, and it mainly concerns burner refractory, its importance, its application, and its fit-up. Firstly, it's important to understand that burner refractory is more than protecting the, the border from excessive heat in certain areas, in other words, as an insulator. It's also there to provide for proper flame shape and serve as an assist in the combustion process after it heats up. Referring to the picture now on the screen, you see three key refractory pieces. We've got the furnace liner, which is there to protect the furnace, and then the dry oven, which is there to primarily provide combustion assistance as it glows hot, and also the beginning of the flame shaping. And then finally you have the throat tile, which is there primarily for shaping and framing of the flame body within the confines of the furnace. Now these refractory pieces are very important, and if existing refractory is acceptable from a performance perspective, in other words, you're retrofitting this burner to an existing border, if this refractory is acceptable as far as performance is concerned, they have to be in excellent shape to accomplish the, their important functions. No large cracks or missing chunks. If these are present, then they've got to be replaced. And then we encounter those situations where the existing refractory is in usable shape, or the standard refractories coming with the new burner are fine, but we have special fit-up considerations because the boiler's design in relation to the new burner requirements are different. Now, in this case, and as you can see on the screen, the standard fit-up of the burner would have placed the firing head in front of this firebox boiler's tube sheet, causing all sorts of pressure vessel problems due to overheating. Now, in this case, the supplier can provide refractory extensions. They would be cut at the proper length and angle to minimally extend two and a half inches beyond the tube sheet, thereby alleviating this problem. So, there you have it. The what, the why, and the how of burner retrofits. So, in summary, I'd suggest the major takeaways for today that you should remember are most burners are replaced because they're worn out. And the average life out there that we find, some might you know, last longer than this, but on average about 15 years. High excess air causes high waste of energy. Remember, 2% increase in O2, 1% energy loss. Poor damper design, a major factor in this loss. If you've got a blade type damper, and that border modulates. Remember, when it cracks open, you've got 30 or 40 percent of the air already. You can't control it very well. That's where the rotary air damper or the foil type damper is going to provide so much more benefit. Some burners are undersized to load. 
And if we've got a situation like that, we've got to check with the border manufacturer before replacing it. Remember, we're concerned about circulation and condensation in this case. I'm sorry, in, in this particular case, over-firing, because the burners are undersized to load, so we're concerned about over-firing. And you've got to check with the manufacturer first to see if this is going to cause any problem with that border. Can it, does it have enough surface to absorb the additional BTUs? And then some are oversized, causing expensive cycling, okay? The pre- and post-purge losses. You might want to seriously check, you know, on, on this to, to uh, replace, go with a smaller burner. But then again, the manufacturer's got to be checked on or checked with to make sure that we're not uh, under-firing to the extent that we cause problems with circulation. And then, of course, the condensation, as I mentioned before. Burner retrofit is a good time to consider the burner management system replacement. And then parallel positioning, we found, is the best combustion control strategy out there right now. And then variable speed drive can significantly reduce electrical costs. And lastly, I can't see. <laughs> Hang on just a minute here, folks. I'm something with my... The, uh, screen here. Reduce NOx emissions through low NOx burners and flue gas recirculation. That that's what we, not only Cleaver Brooks, but we as an industry have found to be the most cost-effective way to reduce low NOx emissions or reduce NOx emissions is through a low NOx burner and flue gas recirculation. You're going to have situations too where you could have a very good burner uh, and you could adapt it to flue gas recirculation. That could be added as a retrofit. So we've got to look at all those possibilities when we're looking at burner retrofit. Before deciding, make sure we review the application, performance, and installation requirements for the job. Those are the, the, the uh, basic points that I went through at the very end here. So with that, let's have some questions. We've got a lot of uh, experts uh, working with me today, so fire away. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much.